Yes, I've been working with native flowers for over 30 years now, largely in research. And then I had a bit of a break as government moved me around a bit for a while. And then <coughs> I finally took uh, the golden handshake from government. So I ended up at East Coast back with Craig, who I've known for almost 30 years. So I, I think, Sue, you asked Craig whether he would uh, do a presentation and um, he quickly handballed it to me. Okay. Jonathan, I'm just going to mute everyone and if you get muted in the process, just unmute yourself. Okay, right. Maybe you can tell me if I'm muted. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, you are. So ask to unmute. Okay, yep. Yep, you're back on. Okay. Okay. Um, so... Did that work? Yep. There we go. So Craig and his family who run East Coast, it's largely managed by Craig, um, he moved into native flowers. His father, He and his father moved into native flowers back in the late 80s and then he fully transitioned gradually over time. Most of the uh, growers in the market thought he was insane, but... Um, through some hard times and some tough times, he's coming out the other side doing quite well. Um, the farm at Mangrove, 99% of our production is Australian natives and what we wholesale for a range of growers, including ourselves, probably three quarters of that is wholesale. A lot of it's either South African or Australian native. So we sell for growers from around the country. Um, to be able to supply florists in Sydney and um, event customers. So we will ship um, from different transport companies to uh, customers from Melbourne to Brisbane and out far as far west as Dubbo. And uh, I suppose we attempt to grow commercially over 120 native species from 75 genera and 23 families, which just adds to the challenge. We've got two farms on the central coast. Um, and as Sue said, we've got 25 acres under cultivation. We've also got 25 acres of managed bushland and one acre under cover, so under plastic houses. Now, you may disagree with me, but I'll tell you the easy part. Anything can be grown anywhere. If you throw enough resources at it and enough technology. So just to um, give you an example of a case in point, this is uh, a glass house in Hokkaido, which has the latitude of the southern tip of the equivalent of the southern tip of Tasmania. And you may be able to see from that heading what they're growing. And they've got the technology to grow very expensive mangoes at that latitude under three metres of snow. And they've developed production techniques and temperature adjustment techniques to be able to induce the mangoes to flower and fruit under those conditions. And they look, over the, look after those fruit very particularly and um, sell them for a very expensive price in the Japanese gift market. So, Oops, I'm going to go back for a sec. So I'd argue that growing is the easy part. The hard bit is doing it at the timing you want and cost effectively, ensuring quality, timeliness, optimising use of space, spreading production timings so that you can be able to harvest it efficiently and to sell it. And we give a helping hand to the crops uh, using raised beds, mulch, pruning, regular watering and fertiliser. We try and adjust the microclimate to some degree, um, balance the nutrients, use biological controls where we can, and pesticides and fungicides if necessary. So the challenges is we've got are only sort of the simple things that half your Australian natives that we want to grow commercially don't really like, like wet, foggy weather that you're all experiencing at the moment. 
and then the potential impacts of fire and smoke that uh, we all had to deal with. Now, that's the Gospers Mountain Fire. It had us under threat for several weeks at the back of 2019. And I don't know, can you see my pointer, Sue? Um, not yet. Okay, so sorry. Yep, okay. there we go. That is our farm, and that is a five kilometer radius to the Gospers Mountain Fire. And that Gospers Mountain Fire in one day moved 10 kilometers that way. And so that was only a ridge and a half away from the farm for a couple of weeks through that fire period. Led to some beautiful, interesting photos, some very challenging conditions, and um, we were actually unable to access the farm or get in or out of the farm for a couple of days because of uh, road closures due to the fires. Ironically, we also use a bit of fire as uh, management of our own bushland to control undergrowth, but also to stimulate flowering some of the crops that we manage in that bushland. Oh, we can skip those. So I thought I'd just um, quickly mention some of the pests. Obviously, we have plenty of caterpillars which we try and use biological controls to control, such as Bacillus thuringiensis or um, Spinotoram, but um, we also use some heavier chemicals sometimes. We've got macadamia twig girdler, which makes a mess of waratahs. Um, when you know how much a waratah is worth, then every flower bud that they destroy is quite significant. And um, you may not be able to see mites individually at our age, but um, when they are let get to this level, which I must say isn't on the farm, but it's a pretty impressive photo of a baronia devastated by mites, um, you can actually see them en masse. And one of our other great culprits is Radis Radis, who uh, loves to chew, chew irrigation lines during summer which can be quite expensive for us. We also have wonderful diseases. Now, when I was working for government, um, I was the first government official to receive this disease sample um, back in 2010, because as you can see, the agonis after dark that it grows on is um, it looks particularly striking. And um, that was our discovery of the incursion of myrtle rust into this country. Now, we don't suspect this was the source, but as you can see how easily visible it is, it became clear and obvious that um, it was here. Well, basically, this disease had never been recorded on Agonis before. In fact, I was working at forestry at the time and um, within the first 12 months, we recorded 100 new species as hosts of this disease that had never occurred on before because they'd never been exposed to metal rust. Um, and I was interested to see on your, your plant sale list for the um, on last Sunday that two of the the most badly affected hosts, native hosts, um, wild hosts, uh, Rhodamnia rubescens and, oh, what is it, Cityoides? Oh, I've forgotten. It's been a while now. Um, you had them both for sale, so just a, a heads up that any yellow pustule. Rhodomatis? Cityoides, thank you. Yes, Rhodomatis. Yes, yep. They... They, they were absolutely smashed in the wild from um, here to the north and um, 
Byron Bay Lighthouse used to have a lot of rotomotor cityoides growing along that ridge line, and um, they were destroyed, those plants. Um, Rhodamnia rubescens provides an amazing host of this, spores of this disease um, to reinfect um, plants across Sydney. Now, it's an airborne disease and we believe that in the initial stages there were two means of transport. One was aerial spread, but the other, the, the other wonderful um, way to move disease is plant trucks. And even though I'd worked in the industry for a long time, I didn't realise really that there was probably about 2 million plant movements up and down the east coast of Australia from Melbourne to North Queensland every day. And um, so that's another way that it gets around. And then we have some of your favourites, like uh, Botrytis on the left, which affects a lot of, affects a lot of things um, during weather like we've got right now, things that are not used to growing in this weather. Uh, you have in the middle there virus symptoms on um, silver bells, Rodanthe manglesii that um, is actually transmitted by aphids. And then you have uh, lovely spore forming structures, sclerotium on um, another rhodanthe that we grow. Uh, it's a soil borne disease, but um, yeah. So there's lots of fun challenges that we try and deal with. But that's probably not what you're interested in. So I'll probably move to where we get our plants and also um, what we grow. So we do get, we do source things commercially, we do propagate ourselves, and we do trade with other growers. So one of the things that I've been working on a lot lately since I came across the East Coast the last couple of years is seed. Um, and we, yeah, do quite a few seed, try a lot of things from seed and um, they're quick, they're cheap. You can do them in large numbers, different times of year. You get some natural variation. They're not always available. And some species can't be stored. So there's just an example of some of the seedlings we germinated ready for pricking out individually, which we have one worker who's, it's her favourite job, thankfully, because we do lots and lots of it and she's very good at it. And so you can see there, rot nest island daisy, trachamine, um, cerulea that we've pricked out and amobia malatum, ready to go out into the field. Our greenhouse and the roomy, our pricking out master. And uh, some of the boys starting planting. We also do quite a few things by cuttings, such as some of the Tylotus species. Um, didn't cover that much, but we do a lot of things by cuttings. And the boss who's joined us online also wants us to do a bit more grafting. And um, that's a grafted Eriosum in Australasius on the right. And that's a, a, a triple combination of Pymelia on the left that's um, been harvested and cut open just to show you how you can see the, the join marks for the, the interstock and the, the scion, which is the top bit and the rootstock in that combination. And it allows us to do some things like this, which we hope to do again um, in the future, such as bringing some of the really exciting Ariostrum and Australasius varieties into cultivation. We also source things from tissue culture. Um, and one of the major crops that we bring in is this Tylotus. It's actually a photo of a variety called Joey. We 
bring more phoenix in now, but we also do a lot of kangaroo paws this way. So moving across to the crops, one of our biggest crops is kangaroo paw. Now, depending on the varieties, we'll either grow them outdoors or indoors in pots. I didn't say earlier we grow a lot of things in pots indoors just because of the challenges of growing them in our climate and our soil type outdoors. Um, we can also modify the environment a bit better inside. Big crop for us in the last couple of years. Oh, sorry. And we grow about 30 varieties of kangaroo paws um, from 30 centimetres to 1.8 metres tall. We've got huge colour range from white, uh, green, yellow, orange, red, pink. And um, we do pick kangaroo paws 51 weeks a year. Now, another crop that's a a lot more seasonal for us, depending on the line of daisies. And um, we have a joke at work that we call ourselves never enough natives. And um, we had the most daisies we've ever had in this year. It, um, and it, they have to be picked in a very short window to be harvested. So they were red anthemanglesii and just to show you a bit of a mix that we have. Um, this is what we call tall daisy rhodanthe chlorocephala, subspecies chlorocephala. Um, there's also rhodanthe chlorocephala subspecies splendida, which is a much finer, more delicate daisy, very pretty though. And they actually hybridise to form an inter-subspecies hybrid which is, can be quite attractive. That's splendid again, tall daisy, uh, silver bells. We try some pots. And because of the narrow window, we actually hang flowers. I'm sorry, Narumi, I've distorted you there, but we hang a number of daisies to extend our sales window. So we, because they're everlasting, they can dry and... Um, we probably have it. We probably now dry three quarters of our crop to be able to not crash the market in the limited number of weeks that we're actually picking it over. Now, something you're all familiar with is one of the things that we spend a bit of time on is trying to grow flannel flower. And um, over the years, with other growers and with government, there was a lot of work to establish flannel flowers. Um, we grow them quite successfully in pots. There was some work some years ago where to spread the production. Um, so we have a very spring dominant uh, supply, but we can pick them most weeks of the year. And that's just some of our production area for flannel flowers. We grow it all under cover to maximise quality um, and to have some control. Now, Sue didn't believe me, but one of the boss's favourite things is uh, this little dainty flower here, which you probably all know because of its mass flowering in the Blue Mountains this year. We do grow a little bit of pink flannel flower Actinos forsythii, and um, it can be quite tricky for us, but uh, very well liked. Now on the on our other farm, this is, we grow most of our waratahs. Although we are reworking our waratah block at Mangrove Mountain, um, they're very spectacular plants. Great when they're working well. Another pest that is very fond of waratahs are deer, and they love biting heads off, which is a very expensive. They, it's as though they like tasting different varieties and uh, can be problematic to control or manage. And so, 
You can see the boss has been picking hard at the home farm when he comes along with a load of Waratahs. Another crop group that we work on um, have been expanding is Tylotus. You've got a range of different species there. Uh, Exaltatus, Macrocephalus, Dromondi, and um, now I'm going to forget. Have to look. I know it is Able Star, which is the variety. Yeah, I haven't gotten to speak. Oh, Obovatus from memory. And that's the Dramondi little, it's very dainty little thing, but I quite like it. Because we're supplying all year, we also grow a lot of foliages and um, it's not the best shot demonstrating, but that's the after dark. We grow in significant volume and it's quite a big crop. We also harvest um, different foliages such as Rova and Serrata here, Banksias, as well as um, a lot of wattle foliages, gum foliages, and then some specialty foliages like Hypercalama, the variegated Hypercalama. It's quite in demand, quite hard for us to manage, but quite an interesting crop. And then you get the really special plants that um, have come out of the Queensland rainforest, such as this Apisthia lepus that uh, does quite well at mangrove and Apisthia lepus heterophylla. It's, um, it's known for the gold reverse of the foliage. So it's this great contrast between the green front and the gold reverse and very popular long-lasting foliage. We don't have that much of it. We're working on increasing it, but um, it's very beautiful. And then what used to be Potosporum rhombifolium, it's had a name change. Um, I think it's Arantacarpia. Mm -hmm. That will be used in um, mixed bunches as well or sold on its own. Uh, but we will we'll sell, we'll pick and sell a lot of foliages um, both for direct sale and also to go into our mixed bunches. And then we're coming to the later part of the year, which we're just about to head into now, and flowering gum is a very big volume crop for us, takes up a, a lot of space and a lot of time, but um, is also quite valuable. And um, it becomes the challenge to get the volumes off in the time that we need to coming into Christmas. It does extend from now through till April with the varieties that have been selected over time. And we occasionally select our own varieties. Um, one of the varieties that is really hard to grow is summer snow um, because the graft combinations for it have never really been worked out that well and a lot of the plants fail. So we've actually started growing the seeds of this variety and we have natural variants that come up such as this variety that Tim has named after himself. No, we've named after Tim. Mm -hmm. But it's a pretty little variety that um, we've got some nice varieties coming. And then we have the standard, more, more standard Carimbia forms. Now, as discussed, we also do mixed bunches at certain times of the year, um, particularly hitting our big markets for Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, through spring when we have a lot of product and going into Christmas. Um, and they will be seasonal depending on what we have a lot of or what we can access. You can see these two pretty happy with their bunches. And um, you may notice that a lot of my shots actually have this sidebar on the side, which means that I've extracted them from Craig's Instagram feed, which is one of the ways that the florist industry communicates in a real-time manner. Um, so we, Craig has, I'd have to ask him, but I think he has something like 16,000 followers on Instagram. 
and um, he uses this as a quick way to communicate with the florists if we have a lot of product or what we have new coming into store. We also have cooperative arrangements with uh, some growers in Western New South Wales and um, Craig will make the trip out with the truck to Forbes and Grenfell to pick some of the most spectacular Western Australian gums. There's Alicia on the farm. And you can see bunching these beauties and getting them onto the truck and, and trolleys. It's a lightning operation. It's a half a day there, half a day picking and half a day back. And then it's trying to survive the onslaught of florists as they uh, hit the market floor to buy these products. One of the key growers we, we work with locally is uh, Luff Partnerships at uh, Kalnira. And they've been breeding now for 30, 25 years, I think, um, Zero Chrysum, or what we still call Bracteantha. And um, they're always producing new and better hybrids every year that um, are very popular in the, in the market. We're getting products from different places. So this is a farm down the south coast that produces some of our best foliage at market, um, better than we do on the farm at the moment. They've obviously they've got their systems down and their climate right, and um, they do a very good job. And then there's the major supply of good Banksias in the country, Banksia Company from South Australia, that we source a lot of material from. And you can see the banks of your coccinias in the background there that um, we would have no hope of producing at the moment. We also have a big supplier out of Western Australia, Wafex, who supply a lot of different native products as well as other products, including the beautiful yellow bells, Gelasnaui varicosis and Baronia, but we can grow some of the Baronia ourselves. Um, although we do have a bit more bypass in our climate, which means that you get growth through, through the bunches a little bit, but we do have to graft the Baronia as well. And then there's one of those challenging crops that um, is slow and time consuming. Caterpillars love it, birds damage the flowers and weeds love getting in there. But Blandfordia, your local emblem, is um, coming in right at the moment now. And um, what longer they can hold to Christmas, the happier we are. And some foods on the bench. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and we're just coming into Rottnest Island daisy season, which will run from now through till early February. Um, we grow a couple of rows of tracamine. It's a little bit hard to pick, but it's just so unusual and the colour's so different. Um, okay. And then there's a range of things that we try and grow that we don't always succeed in. Um, and when they grow well, we're very happy. Sometimes it's a bit expensive for us, but... Um, it keeps our customers coming back to us because they can't get them anywhere else. So Sturt Desert Pea, um, we'll grow some Aramophila Nivea. We're looking at getting back into growing Pimelia spectabilis and some of the different Pimelia such as Quallop Bell, which I've got my slides around the wrong. And one of the things that was quite popular last year, we still haven't quite got our handle on, but oh, sorry is the actinodium, the Albany swamp daisy, which haven't quite got right yet. And then there's another one for us to work on a bit more is Quallop Bell, which we know can grow up here. We just need to sort out all the problems. And then we're always looking for new crops. So we're looking at different things all the time. One of those examples is Calistema from Western New South Wales. You can see the colour variants of the, 
the li native lily out there. I don't know why the boss is holding his head at the moment. I don't know what he's thinking right now. <laughs> he must be pretty tired after a night at market. And then we've got to sell them. So most of our sales are through Sydney Wholesale Market. Um, we will ship orders from there. We have orders ready to pick up there. And then we have the customers that only access the floor. And you can see what it looks like at 5 a.m. on our stand in spring. And you can see what it looks like at our warehouse at 1.30 in the morning on Christmas Eve. This is our little warehouse. We've brought the whole truck of trolleys out. We've brought all the trolleys out. We're starting to pack orders to ship interstate. These are orders to be picked up on the market floor. And all of this that survives us packing orders from on that night, 9 p.m., through till 3 a.m., then has to go up to the market floor up here and when it'll hit the stand. And so that's just before Christmas. You can see all the orders for florists to pick up across the back, the florists in the stand. It can be pretty crazy. And when Craig goes and gets a truck of Western Australian gum like he did last weekend, it was pretty crazy <laughs> on Monday morning. But he loves it, I'm sure. <laughs> So how do we promote? Well, a lot of our promotion is um, through word of mouth or through cheap online posting such as Instagram. So this is how to generate a price for a, a single stem of Christmas bush that you're not going to find anywhere else. That will be posted the night before and then the big florists who have the money will be choosing. We compete in the Flower Grower of the Year category um, at Sydney Markets, which we were lucky enough to win back in 2018. I think we came third this year, which was announced this morning. We also allow fashion labels to shoot. It's interesting what they use, some of our worst-looking flowers sometimes, I think, <laughs> to, um, to advertise their product for swimwear labels and different things like that, um, fashion magazines. Craig also supports a lot of industry events with florists can go to town letting their hair down, so to say. Um, so this was a, flower, a florist workshop using just native flowers that was heavily subsidised by us but to, as part of the Wildflower Association to promote to industry. You've probably seen Craig on Gardening Australia or if you go commercial, Better Homes and Gardens. Um, I think he's been in all the, the magazines and books and TV shows there is. And then we do farm tours for industry and florists, um, floristry workshops, uh, whole grower meetings for other growers, and we work with Sydney Authority. Market Authority promotions, as well as Craig's quite passionate about ovarian cancer fundraising because of an incident in his family in years gone by. And so this was our ovarian cancer fundraising and awareness event that we picked Rodanthe um, Manglesii specifically for the florist Bess, who donated all the proceeds of all the bunches that she sold in one day to the, um, a fund rate to the charity to help research on ovarian cancer, which was several, which was I think twelve thousand dollars this year. COVID has um, caused us problems at first, but also created opportunities now. I don't know how many of our audience um, buy clothes from Zimmerman. I know I'm not really aware of the brand, but I, nor am I female, nor in their price range. But because they couldn't do their um, runways in Paris or New York last year, 
they ran a virtual runway from the Horton Pavilion and uh, we supplied flowers for it last year. So you can see the volume of flowers that we put in to this event, not purely us, but Craig um, managed all the sourcing. Um, we had three colour themes, blue, pink and yellow, and then they ran their different outfits through the virtual runway and filmed it to send to a world uh, worldwide audience. And uh, Craig worked with Saskia Havix from Grande Flora, major florist, to help arrange the event. And um, I think it went pretty well from all accounts. And you can see how the flowers, this all had to be set up and then shot o over a period of two days. So it was set up over a day or two and then shot over one or two days as they wheeled these trays of flowers in and out between each session. It was amazing, staggering. So hopefully I've given you a little taste of some of the things um, we do and grow and um, given you some idea of what we try and achieve and uh, have to deal with and um, then it's all just another day on the farm. If you enjoyed this video, why not subscribe and view other great content? New videos being added all the time. <laughs>